Well, please open your Bible at 2 Samuel in chapter 18. This is the last message in the series on David for now, for now. Um, we are in 2 Samuel chapter 18. Clearly, that is not the end of the life of David, and God willing, uh, the plan is to come back to uh, this series for a further four weeks uh, during the summer of this year. But today, 2 Samuel and chapter 18, one of my memories of English classes in high school back in Scotland. We didn't call it high school there, but let's not get into that. Um, one of my memories of English classes was of being given two stories or two essays and then being given the con uh, assignment, as many of us will remember the same thing, compare and contrast the one with the other. The word compare uh, meant observe the similarities. The word contrast meant, of course, point out the differences. And really throughout this series, we have been putting the story of David and the story of Jesus alongside each other in order to compare and contrast. Some things we have seen are very strikingly similar. Other things are very obviously different. And I think, for example, about some of the comparisons that we have seen, places where David points very obviously, wonderfully, and directly to the Lord Jesus and almost anticipates the Lord Jesus um, with remarkable precision. I mean, David is God's anointed king. He is the man after God's own heart, and Jesus is the anointed one, the exact representation of God's being and the image of God Himself. Uh, David, we have seen, was despised, and he was rejected. He was driven out of Jerusalem. We've seen him be an anticipation of Jesus as he crosses the brook Kidron and as he weeps his way up the Mount of Olives. All of these things our Lord Jesus also did. And later in the story, when the great rebellion of Absalom is finally crushed, David is brought back in honor and restored as the king, as Jesus Christ. When the great rebellion of sin and of evil is finally crushed, our Lord Jesus comes back in power and in glory, and what a day that will be. But as wonderful as the comparisons are, there is perhaps even more that we can learn from the contrasts. The Holy Spirit uses both in the way that Scripture is weaved together in order to shine a light on Jesus Christ. And today, very simply, I want us, as we prepare to come again around the Lord's table, for us to see how the glory of Jesus Christ shines out from the contrasts between David and his greater Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. And so, I hope you have your Bible open. I want to point out uh, a number of these. Uh, we begin then with David being a king who obviously has many sins. Uh, we began, as we reflect on these last eight weeks, with the story of David and Bathsheba. Remember back to in chapter 11 and verse 2, this whole third and troubled period of David's life begins when we're told that one afternoon, David gets up, and he's walking on the roof of the king's house, and he sees this woman, a beautiful woman, and she has been bathing. And we have been following the painful chain of events that followed David's sin with Bathsheba. Let me just remind you of six repercussions that press home to us the pain and the destruction that comes from sin in the life of one of God's children, as David certainly was. Um, from David's adultery with Bathsheba flow, first, the death of Uriah. You remember that David gave to Joab a sealed letter that was carried to him by this man Uriah himself, Bathsheba's husband. And in the letter, David instructed Joab the commander to put this man, Bathsheba's husband, Uriah, at the very center of the battle, to put him in the way of harm, 
and then to pull back so that he'd be left at the mercy of the enemy. And so effectively, David not only took Uriah's wife, he also took Uriah's life. Second, you have the audacity of Joab. Think about this. The, the, the letter that David sent to Joab, addressed to Joab, this sealed letter with these instructions about put Uriah in harm's way. That letter explains in large measure why it was that Joab became more and more of a thorn in David's side in his later years. You see, Joab knew David's secret. Nobody else knew the instruction that David had given to put Uriah in the line of fire, but Joab knew he had the letter. Like someone having a letter and saying, I could publish this at any time. And it's very clear as the story goes on that Joab uses this with increasingly devastating effect to wield power over the man who God has anointed as king. And he does it to increasingly destructive effect, as we're going to see in the passage before us today. Joab becomes increasingly a wild card, unpredictable. And in large measure, it seems it goes back to this, that he feels free to follow his own policy because he has something that he holds over David. And then we've seen that there was the loss of Ahithophel, this man who was the fount of wisdom, David's right-hand person, who had been a strategist and a close advisor. His counsel, remember, had been as the very Word of God, and we saw that one of the effects of David's sin was that he lost the support of this most trusted friend and advisor. And then we saw the tragedy of the suffering of Tamar, David's own daughter, horribly abused by her own stepbrother Amnon. And David's sexual sin repeats itself in his own family and in a far uglier form. A father could have no greater sorrow than to see his own sins being repeated in the lives of his children. And David knew that sorrow. And then as we followed the story, there was the death of Amnon, Absalom, David's son, who's the focus of this part of the story where we are now, takes vengeance on Amnon for what he had done to their sister. David had ordered the elimination of Uriah. Now Absalom orders the elimination of Amnon, and the word of Nathan the prophet is coming true. The sword shall never leave your house. David found that he was living under the discipline of God as these repercussions just tore through his family. And we're beginning to see now in the story tore through the entire nation. And repercussion number six is where we are with the rebellion of Absalom. Here's this son, Absalom. David loves him with all of his heart, but Absalom does not love David. Absalom's a rebel. He hates his father, and he hates God. And he lures the people away from their loyalty to David, and he leads this great rebellion that splits the nation. So, think about this. All that has come from David's indulgence and his lust and that sexual sin back in chapter 11 the repercussions, the waves that are going on, the death of Uriah, the audacity of Joab, the loss of Ahithophel, the suffering, the awful suffering of Tamar, the death of Amnon, the rebellion of Absalom. It's a devastating trail of destruction. Why is it in the Bible? It's to say, when you are tempted, think so carefully and see that sin brings a trail of destruction always in its wake. Now, here we are. We're looking at the story of David. And David surely is one of the heroes of the Old Testament. And yet, what we've been seeing throughout this last part of his life is how disappointing he really is. 
You read these chapters in 2 Samuel, you inevitably come away saying, we need a better king than this. And after all the wonderful ways in which David points to Jesus and anticipates Jesus, we're seeing now that we learn much more by way of contrast. We look at David's life and we say, we need a better king than the one that we're seeing here. Who would have thought that the young hero who had killed Goliath, the skilled leader who we saw wonderfully brought God's people together, the one who had pushed back their enemies and had achieved so much, who would have imagined that this man, who at one time had been filled with the Holy Spirit to the point where he was writing Scripture in laying down these Psalms, that this man, David, would turn out to be the one who would lead his family into disaster and bring the people of God to the very brink of division. Well, you know that hope springs eternal in the human heart, and after David, how does the story go on? Well, then there's Solomon. How does he start? Really well, so wise. Oh, now we've got the king that we really need and that we're looking for, except you read his story, and it follows exactly the same trajectory. Bright beginnings, very sad endings. And if you read through the rest of the history of the kings of Israel in the Old Testament, you'll find that from David and Solomon onwards, it's pretty much downhill for the rest of the Davidic kings. None of them come close to the achievements of David or Solomon. And all of them carry exactly the same bent to sin. So, you read through this story, and it brings you to the place of saying, where will we ever find a king who is all that God calls us to be? And that, of course, gets to the heart of the human problem. This is the central message, really, of the Old Testament. It opens up the problem to which Jesus Christ is the answer. And what is the problem? It is that none of us can or ever will fulfill the life that God has called us to lead. The most gifted person in this room cannot do it. And the most godly person in this room has not done it. We are sinners by nature and by practice. We are sinners in thought and word and deed. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That is the human condition. It is true in every culture. It is true in every generation. It is true of women. It is true of men. It is true of the rich. It is true of the poor. It is true of black and white and churched and unchurched. It is true of every person, of every inclination and every disposition. It is the universal truth to which the Old Testament Scriptures bear witness and the new, that not a single one of us has lived the life to which God has called us not even close. Not even David. And so here's this king with, with many, many sins. And his story leaves us looking for a better king. Second observation by way of contrast, this is also a king who cannot save. If you have your Bible open at chapter 18 now, as we take up the story and move it forward after that brief review, David has now mustered together, gathered together thousands and hundreds in an army that is standing with him in verse 1. You remember how this happened. We looked at it last week. Ahithophel had advised Absalom to pursue David immediately on the very day that he left Jerusalem. And David just had a very small band of supporters at that time, and if Absalom had done as he had been advised, he surely would have succeeded. But then God used this spy, a man by the name of Hushai, who came up with some alternative advice and advised a delay in order to gather a huge army from north, south, east, and west, and Absalom, you should be the one that's at the center leading it all. And that delay bought David time, and in the grace of God, during the delay, there were not only hundreds, but thousands who came to Mahanaim where he had retreated, and they took their stand with him. 
And so now at the beginning of chapter 18, you have two armies that are ready for battle. David has three commanders, Joab, Abishai, and Ittai, whose loyalty we noted before. David wants to go into the battle himself. And he says, verse 2, I myself will also go out with you, but his loyal people simply will not let him go. And I love this in verse 3. He sa- they say to him, you are worth 10,000 of us. Isn't that beautiful? There's loyalty. You're worth 10,000 of us, they say to the king. Your life is so valuable, it cannot possibly be put at risk. And David accepts their counsel And next, he tells us why he was so eager to go with the army into battle. And this is the key verse, verse 5. Deal gently for my sake with the young man Absalom. That's why he wanted to be there. I know there's going to be a battle, and I know that there's an enemy that has to be defeated, but I want Absalom coming out of this alive. And I'm saying to you, my commanders, you make very sure you deal gently with Absalom. If I'm not going to be there to keep an eye on you, I'm giving you this command. Now, David could hardly have made this instruction clearer than the order that he gave. Look at what it says here. He ordered, he ordered Joab and Abishai and Ittai. In other words, this is face to face, eyeball to eyeball. Are you getting this, Joab? Are you getting this, Abishai? Are you getting this, Idai? Could not have been clearer. Whatever happens, I do not want any harm to come to Absalom. That's the king's priority. Not only did he make this order clear, he made it public. Verse 5, all the people heard when the king gave orders to the commanders about Absalom. So, it wasn't just the three commanders who heard. They all heard. The whole army was aware. Whatever happens, nothing is to cause harm to Absalom. And then notice that the king gave the highest possible reason for this clear order that he gave so publicly. He says, deal gently for my sake with Absalom. In other words, he's saying to his commander, now look, this is personal. This is for me. And I'm asking this one thing of you as you go into battle. You make sure you don't mess up on this. I want Absalom coming back alive. So, verse 6, the army went out into the field against Israel, and the battle was fought in the forest of Ephraim. The battles passed over as if it were nothing. The whole focus is on what happens to Absalom. And in the course of this battle, we are told, verse 9, that Absalom happened to meet the servants of David. So, here now, as the retreat is happening on the part of Absalom's forces, there's confusion in the forest. People are moving in all kinds of different directions, and it so happened that Absalom met the servants of David. Now, what's Absalom going to do as soon as he sees the servants of David? He's going to flee as fast as he possibly can. And that is exactly what he did. He clearly turned and he fled. And verse 9, Absalom was riding on his mule. And the mule went under the thick branches of a great oak, and his head caught fast in the oak, and he was suspended between heaven and earth while the mule that was under him went on. Have you got that clear in your mind? So, Absalom was hanging on a tree. Think about that. His head clearly had been caught, and perhaps this was even something to do with his hair that has been suggested, which was such a feature you may remember before. He was so proud of it. But what we're told here is that his head was caught, perhaps in a forked branch of this oak tree, the lower-lying branch, and he's on the mule, and, and perhaps he was looking back as he's fleeing, and he runs into this thing, and he's caught, the mule keeps going, and there he is suspended between heaven and earth. Then we're told that a certain man, not named, 
But some unnamed person, verse 10, saw him and then went to Joab to report what he saw. Behold, I saw Absalom hanging in an oak. Now, the significance of the tree, this is very important, the significance of the tree is simply this, that in the New Testament we read, cursed is anyone who hangs upon a tree. That's Galatians chapter 3, verse 13, and it's citing an old law from Deuteronomy in chapter 21. And here's Absalom, and he's the rebel son of David, and he clearly is under the curse of God for his own multiple sins. And when this unnamed person sees Absalom hanging there and reports this to Joab, Joab says to him, in effect, well, I, I, I hope you finished him off. I hope you struck him to the ground. He says, I, I, I would have given you ten pieces of silver if you'd done that. And then this unnamed man says these remarkable words in verse 12, even if I felt in my hand the weight of a thousand pieces of silver, I would not reach out my hand against the king's son. For in our hearing, the king commanded you and Abishai and Idai, for my sake protect the young man Absalom. My king wants his son protected, and I would not betray him for a thousand pieces of silver. That's what he says. Extraordinary. Well, Joab has absolutely no time for that. Verse 14, in effect, he says, get out of my way. I'll not waste any more time with you, he says. Absolutely despises this man's loyalty to the king. Remember, Joab is the commander but he's got the king's letter about Uriah. He's got it over the king. What does he care about the, world, the word or the will of the king? And so, pressing the unnamed young man to the side, Joab goes forward with his ten armor, armor bearers and puts Absalom to death. And here's the point, David can do nothing to stop it. He's the king and yet he cannot even save his own son. Then, Joab and his men throw Absalom's body into a pit that evidently was nearby there in the forest, and verse 17, raised over him a very great heap of stones. Jewish writers actually speak of a tradition that in the following years emerged in which when people went past that area and saw the pile of stones, they would throw another one on the top. And they would say, cursed be Absalom and any other child who rebels against his or her parents. Now, think about this. David is a powerful king. He can slay Goliath, but he can't save his own son. Even when he gives the clearest, strongest, most public command and instruction, a personal order for my sake, he can't do it. He's a king who cannot save. So, you read this story and you think, we need a better king because this king, is, is, his life is just riddled with sin. And you say, we need a more powerful king because this king doesn't have the ability even to get his will done when he seeks some good thing in regards to his own. And then there's one more thing that I want you to see, and it is so plain in the passage that was read to us that David is a king who cannot become a substitute. He is a king who cannot become a substitute. In the story that follows, the one that was read for us a little earlier, 
we hear how the news of the triumph in the battle came to David. There was a man by the name of Ahimaaz, and he was a loyal servant of David and a very fast runner. We picked up references to him in his running a couple of times in the story before. And as a fast runner and loyal to David, he wanted to be the one to bring the marvelous news that David's forces had prevailed over the forces of Absalom and that the great rebellion was finally done. But Joab, very interestingly, does not want this man, Ahimaaz, to go. Joab knows that David is going to have more sorrow over the death of his son than he has joy over the victory of his army, and he wants to protect Ahimaaz from being the one who brings the bad news. So Joab sends a Cushite, an African, who becomes a hero of the story. Ahimaaz won't take no for an answer, and so after the Cushite has gone on his way, and he also is running with the news for the king, Ahimaaz persuades Joab that he also will go, and so although he leaves later, he goes by another route, and he's a very fast runner, and he actually manages to get there first. And he announces the good news to the king, verse 28, all is well. Blessed be the Lord your God who has delivered up the men who raised their hand against my Lord the King. Oh, it's good news, David. Everything's fine. All is well. The battle is won and the rebellion is over. And David cares only about one thing. Verse 29, is it well with the young man Absalom? Now, Ahimaaz knew that Absalom was dead, because if you look back at verse 20, that's the very reason that Joab gave him for not being the one to go as the runner. You don't want to be telling that news. So, he knew for sure that Absalom was dead. But here's something about Ahimaaz that speaks to us today. He was very keen to be the announcer of good news, but he sure bottled out when it came to telling the truth that was difficult for David to hear. I saw a great commotion, he says, but I really don't know what happened, verse 29. And notice the response of David. David says, turn aside and stand here. In other words, David instinctively knows, I'm never going to get the truth from you. You don't have the courage to say it straight. You're the kind of proclaimer of good news that always wants to say what people want to hear. You don't want to bring the stuff that's difficult to hear the supreme irrelevance of a messenger who announces good news but does not have the courage to speak the truth when it is uncomfortable to hear. David said, you're not the messenger I want to listen to. You just stand over here. And then the Cushite shows up, and he tells the whole story. The victory is won. The rebellion is over and Absalom is dead. And then we come to verse 33, and I want you to see this, and the king was deeply moved. And he went up to the chamber over the gate, and he wept. And as he went, he said, oh, my son Absalom, my son, my son Absalom, would I had died instead of you. Oh, Absalom, my son, my son. Do you see what David is saying here? Absalom, if only I could have taken your place. If only I could have been the one hanging on the tree instead of you. If only I was the one who was under the pile of stones. If only I was able to take your death and you could have my life. But David cannot become the substitute for the son he loves so much. So put the story together. And what do you have? You have in David Israel's greatest king. They don't come any better than David for all his flaws, his achievements, and his greatness without question. But here is a king with many sins. And here is a king who does not have the power to save, 
And here is a king who cannot take the place of the rebel son that he loves. And the story just leaves you saying, we need a better king than this. And so do you see how powerfully this story points by way of contrast to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ? Let me just try and gather this together in these last few minutes for you in this way. Here are five contrasts from this story that show the unique glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. First, there's the contrast over the sin. David, a king with many sins, roll the story forward a thousand years, and David's greater son is born. The Son of God is born into the line of David. That's very important in the Bible. He comes into this line of descent, and here is the contrast. David is the king with many sins, but as Jesus comes into the world and then lives that perfect life in obedience to the Lord, he committed no sin, and no deceit was found in his mouth. Jesus was the only person in human history who ever perfectly fulfilled the life that God calls all of us to live. That means that His life is infinitely precious. And think about this by way of contrast. While David stayed back from the battle because his men said, you're worth more than 10,000 of us, Jesus, whose life is infinitely precious, goes into the battle and lays down His life for us. Then think about the silver. A certain man who was loyal to the king, and he said even for a thousand pieces of silver, he would not give up the son of David. And we know about another man who professed to be loyal to Jesus, but gave up for just 30 miserable pieces of silver, the very Son of God. And then think about the tree. Anyone hanging on a tree is under God's curse. Absalom was hanging on a tree. Jesus was hanging on a tree. But here's the contrast. Absalom was under the curse on account of his own sin. Why was Jesus on a tree? He was under the curse on account of our sin. He was there for you, and He was there for me. The apostles often refer in the New Testament to the cross as a tree, and the reason that they refer to the cross as a tree is precisely to make this point, to tell us what was happening when Jesus died on the cross. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us, for it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. And you say, why would Jesus be under the curse? Here's why. He bore our sins in His body on the tree. And that takes us to the fourth great contrast. Jesus is our substitute. What David wished he could do with Absalom, if only I could change places with you, if it could be me that suffered that end so that you might live, I, I would do it, I would do it, I love you so much, but he couldn't do it. And what David could not do for his son, Jesus Christ, has done for you and for me, brother and sister. What was due to us actually went on him. He really did die the death that was coming to rebels like you and like me. David would say to Absalom, oh, that I would have died instead of you, and Jesus can say to us, I did die instead of you. And then I moved just by pondering these stones. Absalom buried, what a scene that was, under this enormous pile of stones. 
And when the body of Jesus was taken down from the cross, it was laid in a tomb, and what was done to seal the tomb? A great stone was moved over the entrance to the tomb. Here's the contrast. The body of Absalom remained under that awful pile of stones. It never moved. But Jesus rose from the dead, and when He did, the stone was rolled away, right? A living Savior. That's our Jesus. And it is because of Jesus, our risen Savior, that there is hope for sinners like David, and there's hope for sinners like you and me. The king with many sins, David, was actually able to say, nonetheless, the Lord is my shepherd, the Lord restores my soul. There's hope for David. Why? Because of his greater son, Jesus Christ. That's why there's hope for you and for me. Jesus Christ saves sinners. He does that because he is able to do and has done what David was never able to do, even though he would have wanted to do it. He stood in our place. He became our substitute. He bore the curse for us in his body on the tree. And when it was done, he rose from the grave in triumph, leaving the stone behind him. Let's pray together, shall we? Father, our hearts are lifted as we think of the glory of Your Son, Jesus Christ, who loved us and gave Himself for us. And we thank You that we now draw near to Him around the table, the Savior who loves us, this One who saves us, this substitute who put Himself in our place so that the life that belongs to Him may be ours forever and forever. Lead out our hearts in thanksgiving, praise, confidence, faith, worship towards Your Son, Jesus Christ. And as He offers Himself, grant that for every person we may embrace Him as our Savior, our Lord, and our King. For these things we ask in His name, and everyone together said, Amen.